Good afternoon, friends. My name is Todd. I'm from the area. I live in Spring Valley. Uh, I am a regional missionary here in southeast Minnesota, northeast Iowa. Uh, once in a while I get into Wisconsin when they'll allow me across the border. Uh, the church that I'm part of, that I'm sent from, is called Redemption Hill. It's in Stuartville. Uh, we are a gospel-centered, cross-centered church. We believe in the proclamation of the gospel so that uh, all who hear can repent and believe and be saved by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The reason that that message is so important is chiefly because God has commanded it. God at, sent Christ, who at the end of his earthly ministry, after being crucified, buried, and resurrected, just prior to going again into heaven, left the, his followers, the early church, he left them with the command to go into the whole world, preach the gospel to all creatures, making disciples as they go. It is a very literal command. It literally means go into the whole world and preach the gospel to all creatures. And that's why I and others in my church and, and other friends that I have around the United States do what we do. So people can hear and believe because that is the means by which God has determined that his gospel message be sent out and delivered into the world. I know that this is a very foreign concept to most people today. Oftentimes people see someone doing evangelism in public and their first response or first thought is, oh, they must be Mormon or they must be Jehovah's Witnesses. I am neither. I am a Christian. The message of the gospel can be awfully uncomfortable but is also very comforting and beautiful all at the same time. In the early days of the early church, Peter, one of Christ's apostles, stood up in the middle of Jerusalem, a city that makes Lanesboro look even smaller than it already is. At the time, Jerusalem was a major metropolitan area, somewhat the equivalent of, say, Minneapolis or St. Paul. When he stood on that day in Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost, Peter said this in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words, for, those people, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That's how foreign the message of the gospel was and how foreign the behavior of Christians was to the people of Jerusalem. They were standing up and they were talking about Christ. They were talking about the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. So much so that people thought the only way that someone would do that would, would, if, would be if they had been under the influence of alcohol. Uh, I've actually been accused of that before. I am not drunk. I am not under the influence of alcohol. The only spirit that I'm under the influence of right now is the Holy Spirit third person of the Trinity. Later in Acts 2, Peter goes on and says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That's a very hard message that Peter delivered to the people in Jerusalem and it's the same message that we need today. Make no mistake, you're no different than the people of Jerusalem. Jesus Christ was hung on the cross by you. And don't think that you're better than the, the ancient, unsettled, non- modern Jews in Jerusalem. Had you lived in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, you would have been crying out for His blood. You would have been crying out, crucify Him, crucify Him, crucify Him. And here's why. Christ was perfect righteousness. His very being, His very presence was an affront to people's sensibility. 
the message of Jesus was one of love, but it was also one of repentance. Everywhere that Jesus went, not only did he heal people to verify who he was, he also commanded people to repent. He commanded people to turn to God, to turn to the Father, to turn to, turn to him and live. And the Jews and the other people in the area or surrounding Jerusalem at the time hated his message. Many of them considered themselves perfectly righteous. Many of them considered themselves perfect followers of God the Father. The Pharisees, one of the sects of Jews who were, le were leaders at the time, were, were perfect at keeping the law on the outside. And the Sadducees were probably even more detailed than the Pharisees were. The biggest difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was their view of the resurrection. Other than that, there are very little differences. But they hated the message of Jesus because the message of Jesus pushed against their, their self-styled, self-righteous mentality that says we are perfect, we're better than everyone around us. That message would strike home to most people today because most of us, as I said earlier, most of us consider ourselves better than people around us better than our neighbors, better than our co-workers, maybe. And if we don't consider ourselves better than our neighbors or our co-workers, many times we consider ourselves better than the person we see in the police blotter in the newspaper or the criminal, or criminal we see on the news reports. Jesus tells a story of two men in the temple praying. One of them is a Pharisee and he looks to heaven and he cries out and he says, oh, God, I thank you that you've not made me like this man. And he points over at this other, other individual. He says, thank you have not made me like this man, for I am perfect in everything that I do. I worship perfectly, I pray perfectly, I give perfectly. Everything I do is perfect. And then Jesus tells about the man that the Pharisee pointed to, and that man says, I am a worm, I am dust. And he wouldn't even look up from the ground. He looked at his feet the whole time as he cried out, to God about how unworthy he was. Most of us are more like the Pharisee than we are like the other man, the public and the sinner. Most of us compare ourselves to other people while they compare themselves to other people while they compare themselves to other people and we think that God grades on a curve, that God is a, a high school teacher or a college professor and that your grade with God is going to be dependent on how good other people do. But see, like high school and like college, there's always one person that comes along and screws up that bell curve. And for us, it's Christ. See, if we didn't have Christ to compare ourselves to, we might actually do pretty good compared to other people. But the problem is, is we have to be compared to Christ. And Christ's perfect righteousness, His perfect obedience to the Father is the means by which God will judge us. If you cannot be perfect as Christ is perfect, if your obedience does not level reach the level of God or Christ's obedience, you will not enter into heaven based on any good work that you've done. In fact, God says that for any person who is not in Christ, our perfect or our best works, our what we consider our perfect works, are like filthy rags. And that's not just a rag you use to clean the sink, clean the floor, clean the toilet, or something you use to wipe grease off your hands and you've been working on the car. When, when we hear that your best work, your most righteous work is like a filthy rag, the word translated filthy rag in that passage of scripture actually means they use menstrual cloth. That's what God thinks of our best works. But we need another work. We need somebody else's work. We need somebody else's completed work. And that's Christ. See, what Christ did on the cross, what Christ did not just on the cross, but for the 33 years that he lived, he obeyed in a way that we can't. He kept the law of God perfectly. He obeyed earthly authority. He obeyed his earthly parents, his mother Mary and his ad adopted father, Joseph, or his stepfather, if you prefer. He obeyed people that he gave life to. God the Creator, 
God the Son gives life to, to people, then God the Son comes in the flesh and obeys earthly parents. People who couldn't even keep the law themselves, he obeyed. He grew in stature and wisdom. He grew in learning. Not that he needed to learn, but people perceived him to grow as a normal person would grow. And he preached and proclaimed the good news. He taught from the Old Testament scrolls about himself. He taught about the promised coming Messiah. And he was that promised coming Messiah. All of the Old Testament points to Christ. The prophets pointed to Christ. The ark, we all know the story of the ark. Noah's ark pointed to Christ. The people who were saved on the ark were saved not because of anything they did, but because God told them how to build the ark. And God decided who would be on the ark. And then God shuts the door of the ark. And the ark saved humanity, just as Christ is the one who can save humanity. So if you're trusting in your own righteousness, if you're trusting in your own goodness, if you're trusting in your own works, if you're trusting in being better than your neighbor, if you're trusting in being better than your best friend. You know what's the old joke goes? Two men are hiking in the woods and a bear starts to chase them. One man stops to put on his running shoes and the guy says, what are you doing? There's a bear chasing us. He says, you're never going to outrun the bear. He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. And that's most of us in our view of heaven, that all we have to do is be better than the person next to us to get into heaven. But that's not the case. None of us can outrun the wrath of God. None of us can outrun the perfect justice of God. But God, being rich in mercy and love, sent Christ to die in our place, to die a sinner's death. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin on our part so that we could become the very righteousness of Christ, or of God. We call that the great exchange. God takes our sins off of us if we are repentant sinners and he places them on Jesus Christ. And then he takes the righteousness of Christ off of Christ on the cross and then he takes that righteousness and he puts it on us. It's a perfect example of what it means to be gracious and gifting. God gifts us the righteousness of the, of the Son while he takes our wickedness and puts it on the Son and then punishes the Son, not just physically, but pours out His wrath against sin on Him while He's on the cross. And the reason that that can happen is because Jesus Christ was infinitely God, eternally God. So He could absorb, in a few for short hours on the cross, He could absorb the sin that we deserve to pay for for eternity. It's often said that it is at the cross where mercy and love are perfectly met by justice and wrath. Without the cross, mercy and grace and love mean nothing. And God is only a God of wrath and justice. But that's not true. God is a God of mercy and wrath and grace and justice and holiness. And before the world was formed, before there was ever a human being to sin, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit agreed together that Jesus the Son would be our Redeemer. That's the perfect plan of salvation. So if you hear this message today, whether you turn today and, and find your life in Christ or it's down the road, think about your guiltiness, not compared to other people, not, not compared to the people around you, not compared to your neighbors or your co-workers or the criminal that's locked up in prison. Com consider your criminal nature compared to Christ. And then cast yourself at the foot of the bloodstained cross of Jesus. Pour out your guilt and confess your guilt to Christ and then plead with him to forgive you. And the Bible says, He who is faithful and just has begun a good work and you will complete it to the, until its completion. He promises you salvation. 
You must but repent and believe. All the work is done. There's nothing you can do. You just only repent. And that is a gift from God as well. So while today is still called today, turn to Christ and live. Plead with Christ for his forgiveness. Plead with God to forgive you through the bloodstained cross of Christ. And you will have eternal life.